Brett McKay here and welcome to another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. I get a lot of questions from readers about love and relationships. Like what should you be looking for in a potential marriage partner? And if you want to ensure a long lasting relationship, how do you approach women? What do women find attractive in men? So I'm really excited about today's guest because we have a PhD who has studied the science of relationships and all the the psychology and research that's out there about what men find attractive in women, what women find attractive in men, and what science says about what makes a lasting relationship work. Her name is Dwayna Welch, and she just came out with a new book called Love Factually, 10 Proven Steps for My Wish to I Do. And today in our conversation, Dwayne and I discuss what the research says about what are the most important attributes in a potential partner for a long lasting loving relationship. We discuss what women find attractive in men and what you can do as a man to be a little more attractive to women. We talk about the science of dating, what you can do to plan a first date that really swoops your gal off her feet, and what you can do before you're married to ensure that you have a long and lasting relationship. Really fascinating discussion. I think you're going to find this really interesting. So let's do this. Dwayna Welch, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Brett. It's so nice to be here. Okay, so can you tell us a little bit about your background and how your book, Love Factually, came to be? Sure. Well, um, I'm basically a lifelong, I guess I'm a lifelong nerd, really. I went to school continually from the age of five to the age of 29, and then I became a professor. And all my degrees are in psychology. I have a PhD in developmental psych. And in somewhere during my graduate school years, I realized that my love life was just this complete train wreck. I was doing really well professionally, and I was doing really terribly romantically. And having a good love life, having a special person in my life was really important to me. I, I really connected with how much I wanted that, and it wasn't happening the way that I needed it to happen. And it just occurred to me one day that maybe – some other nerds out there had actually made that their focus of study, how to find and keep good relationships. And so I started looking into that. And in fact, a lot of people had done that research, and I started learning how to apply it to my own life. So that's really where Love Actually's idea came from was, hey, I use this for myself. I use this for my clients. And now I want it to be available for everyone. Okay. And so, I mean, it's interesting that you can research scientifically relationships and love because you you know, we have this popular idea that it's sort of this ethereal, you know, magical thing. Um, but I mean, how do you, I guess, how do they research what makes for a good relationship? What other, what men find attractive in women and what women find attractive in men? How do you quantify that? Well, so you're right, Brett, when you're in love, it feels ethereal and magical and it is, but uh, humans, person to person, we have more in common than we have different. And that means that uh, science can uncover some of those similarities. And, and scientists have a lot of ways that they do that. They can use surveys. They can use questionnaires. They can actually do experiments where, let's say, they post a particular dating profile and they see who responds to profile A versus profile B. And they can see, you know, from something like that, they can see, well, what do people prefer? Do men and women have different preferences? Are there things that men and women everywhere in the world hold to be valuable regardless of culture? And so um, using a variety of methods, actually, scientists can study stuff like this. Sometimes they even study the same couples for 30 or even 40 years to see what makes happy marriages work. So you start off your book talking about some of the myths, the popular myths about love and relationships. What are the big ones? And how do those keep people away from finding a, a healthy, fulfilling relationship? So there are really four big relationship myths, and they're holding a lot of us back. I know they were holding me back. Um, and largely because many of us don't even realize we're carrying these myths around with us. So an unexamined myth has that much more power to influence us. One of the biggest myths that we carry around, or a lot of us do, is this idea that love is really only for the lucky and the few, and that actually marriage is a crapshoot. Uh, maybe it'll happen to you, and you'll be happy. Maybe it won't. Maybe you'll get married, and you'll be miserable, and it's just completely random. And this idea of random happiness is false. Uh, scientifically speaking, it's really reliable and predictable who's going to be happy. But unfortunately, because people believe that happiness is something that might be given to them and might not, a lot of people are hedging toward remaining single. 
And um, unfortunately, the, the data just don't support that, that if you want real happiness, that that's the way to go. Um, for example, Brett, uh, do you just off the top of your head know what the divorce rate is right now? Uh, well, you hear 50%, but then I hear different things for different socioeconomic groups so that it's like lower for college educated, uh, but higher for un un people who don't have a college education. Yeah, so uh, so that trend is correct, but the 50-50 number is actually an artifact of the 1970s when divorce was at its peak. Studies right now are indicating that people who married in the 1990s and early 2000s it looks like about two out of three of those couples are headed for a lifetime together. It's also looking like uh, the majority of married people are very happy. In fact, married people are more than twice as likely to be happy than people who are living any other way. And by any other way, I mean any other way. You know, if they're widowed or if they're divorced or if they're single or if they're cohabiting. So marriage is actually a pretty good deal, and it's a good deal in a lot of ways. Married people... Um, tend to wind up wealthier even if they started off poorer because of the way that marriage encourages people to organize their economic lives. Um, and because of all the money you don't spend on repeated breakups, you know, breakups are expensive. Have you noticed that? I yeah. noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's one of the myths is that, you know, marriage is, is not going to work out anyway. So why really try? And of course, when we believe that something's not going to work out, how hard do we try? Um, a second major myth is that you really don't have to look for love. It'll just find you. A variation of this is don't look for love or you'll never find it. And, again, science just doesn't go along with that. Um, that, that holds true when you're, you know, in that age group that's meeting single available people all the time. If you're in college or if you're in high school uh, or if you're working someplace where everybody just happens to be single, then – then finding someone without intentionally looking really could happen. But, you know, a lot of us don't find the right person when we're in those environments, and then there we are in an environment uh, that's not rife with the single and available, and we're wondering, why isn't it happening for me? For a lot of us, the reason it's not happening is we really aren't looking, and it, it takes concentrated effort at that point. So that would be a second myth. Interesting. Um, so let's talk about that. Some of, the, you know, if you're looking for a partner, I mean, what – what traits should you be looking and looking for in a potential partner that will not ensure, but uh, hedge your bets on having a fulfilling, long lasting relationship? Well, this kind of ties into another big myth of finding and keeping love, which is that love is all you need. In fact, isn't there a movie right now called love is all you need? I think so. I think so probably. Yeah. So, um, and of course the Beatles made a, a fortune off a song about that. And, um, you know, I don't want to offend anybody who's a big Beatles fan. I love them too, but they were wrong about this. Love is not all you need. You also need at least three other core things. You need kindness, you need respect, and you need similarity. So if you just have love and you don't have kindness, respect, and similarity, that's where you see a pretty high divorce rate. You know, if you're, if you're with somebody who you, you're in love with them, but when things aren't going their way, they treat you badly. Um, that's going to kill your love. Over years, your love is going to end. But if you're with someone who, when things aren't going their way, they can still control themselves and be kind and respectful toward you and toward other people, that really is kind of a, a big, I, I don't want to say red flag because that sounds like a bad thing, but it's a, a huge sign that you have found someone really worthy. And uh, especially if that person is, is really similar to you. It's very important to look for someone who's almost just like you. There was a study where John and Julie Schwartz Gottman, two of the most famous long-term marriage researchers in the world, created a list based on their studies of what couples fight about. And there was one word that started every single item on the list of things people fight about, and that word was differences. But isn't that um, – there, there's a myth out there, or I guess that might be another myth, that opposites attract, right? Yeah, yeah, and there's actually a lot of research on that particular myth. It's one of the best researched of all of them. And um, it's been researched not just in the United States but multinationally and multiculturally. And the answer is if opposites attract, scientists can't find it. Hmm. And when people 
fight. They fight over their differences. But I do think people have a reason for believing that myth exists. You know, after you marry somebody, um, you start noticing the differences you do have. Because even if you pick somebody really similar to yourself, you don't pick your clone, right? Right. So whoever you pick, there are going to be some distinctions. And it's going to be those distinctions that if you're going to have a lot of fights, those are going to be the things you're going to argue about. And so some people get so focused on their distinctions that the relationship kind of becomes about that. And they say, oh, I married my opposite. Interesting. And I guess uh, I might be to that, um, I guess, someone who's sort of opposite to you is sort of attractive because it's novel, it's different in the beginning, but then later on, maybe those differences start to grade on you. Yeah, so that's the idea. Yeah, absolutely, Brett. So Helen Fisher, uh, who's a biological anthropologist, She's done, she's collected this enormous data set of four different personality types, um, builders, negotiators, explorers, and directors. And she found that explorers like other explorers and um, builders like other builders. But then when she exposed people to uh, dating profiles, online dating profiles, and said, who would you like to meet? The negotiators wanted to meet the directors, and the directors wanted to meet the negotiators. In other words, that was the one case where science ever found, yeah, these opposites attract. And so a couple of years ago, I got to interview Dr. Fisher and ask her about those data. And I said, yeah, um, Dr. Fisher, I, I noticed in your writing that you talk a lot about this. I'm wondering how do those relationships work out? Because a lot of other studies indicate that people are fighting about their differences. But you've really found this one specific area where people are attracted to their opposite. And she said, all I know is that there's an initial attraction. I don't know how it works out. What does the research say about what women look for in a man for me? Because most of our reader, l- listeners are heterosexual males. So what is it that women are looking for in them and as a potential partner? And is there anything they can do to make themselves more attractive? I'm so happy you asked that question because um, – Women are, we women are not as complex as we seem, truly. So uh, scientifically speaking, most people are more alike than different. Most men and women are more alike than different, actually. And there are four things that pretty much people of goodwill multinationally, multiculturally, in at least 37 different societies on every continent except for Antarctica – uh, value And the only reason they didn't study Antarctica was, you know, there weren't many people and they didn't want to survey penguins. <laughs> so, uh, so here are the four qualities that really, really matter a lot. And the first one is kindness, which I've already talked about a little bit. And that comprehends respect into it. You want someone who speaks, you want to be someone who speaks well of others. And when you can't speak well of them, you refrain from being harsh. You want to nurture that within yourself because uh, women are definitely looking at that. Um, There are some women who won't insist on it, but you have to ask yourself, do you want someone who's okay with mean-spiritedness? That's not a good sign. So kindness is the first thing. Uh, Lovingness is another. Loyalty is another. Loyalty doesn't just mean sexual fidelity. It also means uh, this person kind of has my back. You know, if I, if I come home and I tell my husband about a bad day at work, uh, a loyalty would mean that he says, that bastard, how dare he say that to you, uh, instead of, well, what did you do wrong at work, you know. He's, got, he's on my side. That's loyalty. And uh, then the fourth thing is intelligence. And that doesn't mean that women want an Einstein. But it does mean that they're looking for someone who approximately matches their own intellect. So, you know, be who you are and realize that, the myth that uh, jerks are the ones that women want is that. It's a myth. Women multinationally do not want jerks. Do jerks sometimes get short-term sexual action? Yes. But the question you asked me, Brett, was about long-term loving action. And that really is a character counts kind of thing. So uh, those are the big four, and you can summarize those as kill. Kill them with kindness. Kindness, intelligence, no- lovingness, and loyalty. What about, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, in the pickup artist community that, that women look for high resources, right? Like it's like hypergamy, I guess is what it's called. You know, men who have lots of money, that's what they're looking for. Is there any truth to that? Well, yeah. So, so it turns out what I just told you was the, the list of what men and women alike want. 
there's a much shorter list um, that's also heavily validated globally of what women want that men don't want and what men want that women don't want. And so the two things that women are looking for, actually it's kind of four things. When women are looking for a long-term mate, they're looking for a man who is all of the following. He's willing and he's able to provide and protect. Willing, able, provision, and protection. And so the pickup artist community, they tend to focus uh, often rather angrily uh, on, you know, women being gold diggers. I'd like to counter that with, you know, men also have their own biologically driven program. This is a biologically driven program that women are operating off. It's kind of their operating system. Men also have an operating system, and their operating system focuses on fertility and fidelity. And women who can't match those standards pay a very high price, just like men pay a very high price if they can't offer willing and able uh, resources. So, um, so I, you know, I, I often hear the sexes getting very angry at each other, uh, but, you know, I, I want to ask, just as I ask women who say, I wish, you know, it's, it's so shallow that men are just about TNA, I say, well, would you date a man who was much poorer than you are? And they admit that, no, they wouldn't. Uh, I would say to the men listening to this, um, if you're upset that women are interested in resources, are you willing to date a woman who's 20 years older than you and not very good looking? And the answer is usually no. And these seem like totally shallow concerns, but if you look at where we inherited these concerns from, you see that there's actually a, a deep psychology to them, even though we might not like them. That's the uh, evolutionary psychology, correct? Yes, yes. So men had to face problems in the ancient past that women didn't have to face. For example, uh, a woman, we always know, if a woman had sex with 100 guys and she got pregnant, she knows whose baby it is. It's hers. Right. It's a genetic slam dunk. She doesn't have to worry that her genes are not going to be cast forward. A guy, uh, when, he, when a woman gets pregnant, at some level, most men wonder, is it really mine? That's, that's an ancestral concern. That comes from a time when men could never have known for sure. Now men can know for sure, but our psychology comes from an ancient time. So men really care about signs of fidelity from women. Women, on the other hand, you know, now we live where there are grocery stores around the corner and hospitals down the road, but women's mating psychology doesn't come from now. It comes from a time when pregnancy itself could kill you Childbirth could kill you, and then the process of trying to raise a young child without a provider and protector could kill you. So it was a very dangerous act for a woman to become sexually intimate with a man who either couldn't or wouldn't provide and protect. One of the ways that we see this, Brett, is women really like tall guys. They really like height. You know, um, I'm, a univer I, I'm a college professor, and every semester I ask men and women in my classes to please – write down a list of everything they consider absolutely essential in a partner that they would get married to. And eight out of 10 women say they want a man who's six foot tall or taller. But do you know what the average height for men is in America? Like five, nine or something like that. Yeah. 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 And I tell women, knock it off with the height snobbery. Stop it. Because um, you're cutting out a huge swathe of the population, and you're doing it for a reason that made sense to your ancestors. In ancestral times, Brett, a woman could be raped at any time by anyone, unless she had a guy who could attack her attackers. So having a big man really made a difference back then. And the big guy probably could hunt more games. So, you know, in the ancient past, that preference for the tallest man, well, that made sense. Now it really doesn't. You know, a five foot five computer programmer can bring home the bacon just fine. So I really talk to women about that, and I know it hurts men's feelings that women are, um, except for the six-footers, it doesn't hurt their feelings, but it hurts guys' feelings that, that women are height-focused. Women are, are also focused, though, I'm going to just, if you have time, I'm just going to sure, tell you no. it kind of illustrates it. Yeah. So I, I, gave, I told my, my students, I teach three classes, uh, and I told all, all my students this story yesterday, and I'm going to tell you the story and then ask for your reaction, and then I'll tell you theirs. So I had a client years ago who was dating this man who was um, very wealthy, 
He was actually from a family that was very famous, although he himself wasn't famous. And this client of mine had two children, and I call the client uh, Diane in the book. So Diane had two children, and uh, she felt that this man was going to propose to her, and she loved him. She wanted to say yes, but uh, she had some hesitation. And I said, you really need to listen to that hesitation because that's your the right side of your brain that does all your unconscious processing. One of its jobs is to protect you. And unfortunately, because the right side of your brain is non-conscious, it doesn't have language. So it can't tell you why it wants to protect you. It just gives you an emotional sense, which we call intuition. And so I said, you need to listen to that intuition. And if he does propose, you need to ask him some questions rather than simply giving him an answer. So he proposed pretty soon after that. And she said something along the lines of, um, I love you and I really want to say yes, but uh, before I do, I, I really want to make sure that I'm making the right choice, not just for me, but for you and for my children. Could you tell me in your ideal world what being married to me looks like? And he described it. In his view, she would move from the city she was living in to the city he was living in uh, where she didn't have a job. And she would um, find a job, and she would never own any portion of the house that they shared. She'd move into his house. And um, she would be responsible for making sure she paid for her children's health insurance. This is a guy who's worth multi-millions of dollars, who had, a, you know, group insurance, and he, didn't, he just didn't feel like doing it. And uh, he also made it clear that, of course, she would be the one to earn and pay for half the bills and all of her children's education. Now, I ask you, in your opinion, Brett, was that a good deal for her? Should she have said yes to this guy? Um, I, I mean, probably not. I mean, it sounds like uh, it was more like a business arrangement than a uh, relationship. Yeah. Uh, so yesterday I told this story to all my students, and 100% of them said that uh, they were strongly in favor of her saying no. And I said, well, that's what she said. And the guy, believing himself to be a great catch because he knew that women value resources, told her she was making a mistake and she would always regret this. And in fact, what she did is she found a man who is worth probably, or was worth probably about one twentieth mm -hmm. financially, one twentieth of this guy's worth. But when he proposed, he made it clear that he was all in. This is the thing. When women value resources they really don't value the resources nearly as much as they value the willingness to provide those resources i don't know if you ever ride a bus but i'll bet you that bus driver's married <laughs> well yeah i mean that raises an interesting question so there's been a lot of talk uh in the past few years about some of the uh, the cultural or social and socioeconomic changes in the workplace where uh, in a lot of cases women are doing better than men are actually becoming the breadwinners. So I'm curious, how does that how does that play out in relationships uh, where women and men have these sort of biological drives, right? Where women are looking for men with resources, but where it's uneven, where the women are actually doing better than men. How does that play out in relationships? Is it affecting relationships? That is a fantastic question. So I'm going to start by by telling you a little bit of research. So these scientists. Um, they asked men to rate their own ambition level. And the experiment was half the men were unconsciously primed with an image of a young, beautiful woman right before being given the questionnaire. And the other, other half of the men were not primed with any, any particular image. Interestingly, the men who expressed the highest level of ambition were the ones who had just been primed with the vision of youth and beauty. We shape each other's evolution. Women have shaped men to want to provide and protect. In fact, from a female point of view, a man who does not want to do these things is not much use as a man. I, I can't be more blunt than that. Just as from a man's viewpoint, they're very unlikely to go for a woman they consider really physically unattractive. So, um, yes, this is affecting relationships. When, when women, and I, I say this as a feminist, um, I believe women should have every opportunity that men have, not at men's expense. I'm not a, 
a person who believes women are better than men, but that, that really there should be equality and opportunity. And what we're seeing is that most of the college degrees right now are being earned by women, and that uh, although there's still a glass ceiling and very few women uh, rise much higher than um, a well-paid employee at a company, very, there aren't very many Sheryl Sandbergs in the world, let's face it. Mm-hmm. Most of the, the big leaders, whether we're talking politically or CEOs or very high leadership positions, almost all of those are still filled by men. But when you look kind of at the level that most people live on, yes, increasingly women are stepping into those kind of middle-class positions, and a lot of men are, for various reasons that sociologists are analyzing right now, um, they're, they're not stepping up. And it's, again, that's for a lot of reasons, but yes, it's affecting relationships. Men feel deeply insecure. They feel insecure about that because they know that women expect provision and protection, and they know that if they've got a woman who's youthful and beautiful, other men are going to be attracted to her, right? Yeah. So if there's another guy who can provide and protect better than he can, and she's really beautiful, he's got a, he's got actually a realistic concern. People who who say, oh, that's you know that shouldn't matter. Maybe it shouldn't, but it does. It's kind of like I got a letter from a woman who said that. Uh, this man who was much younger had asked her out, and she realized that she looked pretty good for her age, but that in another 10 years, there was no way they would look like they belonged together. And that whereas you know older men and younger women frequently pair up for a lifetime, the reverse does not often happen. And she was worried, you know, when I get older, and I'm not as attractive anymore, but he is very successful, he can find someone younger. So there, in other words, both sexes have a corollary of this dilemma. And so, yes, it does affect relationships. When one party feels perpetually insecure, it's not going to bode well for the relationship, is it? No. And, and, you know, I've also heard people say, well, but that's the man's problem. He has an insecurity, and there's nothing rooted in reality there. That's not true. You know, the fact is um, studies in evolutionary psych actually looked at women's income level and their stated and expressed income level that they would like their partner to have. And at every income level, women wanted a partner who had more resources than she herself had. And that was true even regardless of the woman's sexual orientation. Lesbian women want a partner with more resources than they have. Straight women want a partner with more resources than they have. It's like men with youth and beauty. You know, if you want to find the two groups that are worried about losing their looks, look at gay men and straight women. Why? Because Men want that. They want youth and beauty. Hmm. So it, it seems like there could be, uh, if things keep going the way they are, there could be some big social, not upheaval, but some big social problems where there's lots of women available, but men who are falling behind, they just, they're not marriage material. You know, it, it's really fascinating to me that you're bringing this up, Brett, because uh, this past Wednesday, I sent out 50 of my books to celebrities in Hollywood. And most of them were women, not because my book is for women, my book is for both, but because most of the celebrities that are single are women. Now let's ask ourselves why. When those guys become super famous, they have their pick, don't they? Sure. When women become super famous, do they have their pick? No, they just have the guys who made it, right? Yes, and the guys who made it don't have to restrict themselves just to the A-list, do they? No. So actually, women lose power when they gain power. This is, in in some social scientists, and definitely in my estimation, one reason why a lot of women hold themselves back. There was even one guy who wrote a book. I'm not going to name the book because I don't like it. I, I don't think it's well done. But he actually advises women never to get a Ph.D. And, of course, I didn't like that book because I have a Ph.D. Um. But yes, as, as women gain, there will be social, and there are, and there will be social problems because having a partner who feels perpetually insecure, as with a man who uh, his female partner has a lot more resources, and having a partner who uh, maybe is perpetually dissatisfied, like some of these women with their lower resource wielding mate, that's not an emotionally comfortable place for the long term. Sure. So I don't know what they. Uh, I, I don't the have a solution. Is, yeah. I don't. I don't have a solution here. I mean, I think we really need to work on 
how we're raising boys right now and, and give them more self-esteem. I, I really think that um, there are still perks for being a man but uh, and, and being a boy, but I also think that the way we're raising, raising boys right now does not make boys feel very good about being boys. And they need to feel great about being boys, just like girls need to feel great about being girls. And uh, I do think that we're creating problems for long-term couplehood. Yeah, I do. Interesting. Well, let's go on to this. So uh, you talk about the best place to meet a potential partner. Um, where is the best place? Because everyone has their idea. Like, you know, a lot of people, if they're looking for a mate, they go out to the bars or the clubs. Are those the best place to find a potential long-term partner? really interesting. There was a huge study done on this this topic um, very recently, and uh, the Harris survey looked at uh, everyone who got married. Well, it wasn't everyone. They had a sample, but it was randomly sampled, so it was a good scientifically well-done survey. They looked at marriage patterns over the period from, I believe it was 2000 to 2008, and the data analyses what they're looking at is is who married whom and where did they meet and how happy are they today. And what they found was that, uh, yeah, some people do meet in bars, um, but a third of people in that period of time got married to someone they met online. And that really shocked me. I, I've got to tell you, and it, it, what's really funny about it, Brett, is I'm married to someone that I met online. <laughs> <laughs> so it was funny because I'm living the data, but I was still surprised by them. So it turned out that uh, a third of people in that time per- period had married someone they met online. What was really interesting was the people who met and married someone they had met online were slightly happier than people who met any other way. That really shocked me because I would have thought, you know, a lot of people online are lying and falsely presenting themselves. And I don't know. I just I had a lot of stereotypes about it. But one reason I appreciate the science so much is I'm just wrong a whole lot of the time. (laughs) And the science tells me where I'm wrong. And that's one of the areas where I was wrong. Uh, People actually really are doing well when they find a mate online. So, yeah, there are better ways than than bars. Um, Another really good way is I bet some of your listeners have kind of the the one that got away, the girl they could never forget. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that uh, research indicates that might be someone you should go back to and see if it could work out. There's a profile for lost lovers who find each other again and and get married. And uh, if people match that profile – I just want you to take a guess at the divorce rate for the people who re- reunite with uh, an old flame uh, that fit this profile, I'll and then they get married. What, what do you think that divorce I'll rate say is? say 75%. Are you ready? I'm ready. Two. Two percent, wow. Two percent. That's crazy. The, the, the stay married for life rate for those people is 98%. And they're very happy together. I, in fact... I really encourage people, if they fit the profile, and that's a big if, if they fit this profile, to go back and find that one that they cannot stop thinking about and see if it's going to work out. So uh, it, the nutshell version of this profile, and this is research done by um, a scientist named Nancy Kalish. Uh, these are people who usually met when they were very young. The relationship may or may not have even been sexual. They might have met in the sixth or seventh grade. Uh, they they probably were told that it was puppy love, that it wasn't real. But you know what's interesting? Kids fall in love, and it's real love. For some of them, it, it truly is. Uh, they it, The relationship may never have been sexual, or it might have been, depending on when they met. The reason for their separation usually was that their parents tore them apart, either by being, frankly, quite mean and overprotective and just ripping them apart, forcefully or by moving them. You know, military move was a common reason. Um, And usually they'd been separated at least 10 years when one or the other of them decided to reconnect. Here's Here's who's not a good idea to get back in touch with. Guys, if 
this woman that you've been thinking about, if the reason you broke up was she was mean to you, she's unkind, she's, she was disrespectful, uh, you had serious personality differences, don't even bother calling or texting or writing or whatever. It's just that's, that's a no. People don't change that much. But if the reason for your separation was something that had nothing to do with your chemistry and your attachment to this person, that is a really, really good place to start looking. Okay. So you use that Facebook profile. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In fact, <laughs> Dr. Kalish, she let me interview her too. And she was telling me that Facebook has created a lot of problems, actually, because people who are already married, who kind of keep thinking about their eighth grade sweetheart that they never forgot about, they'll get back in touch with that person thinking, oh, it was, it was just puppy love. It's not going to really make a difference. And something like six out of 10 of those folks wind up abandoning their mate that they're happily married to and abandoning their children and taking up with someone they knew in the eighth grade. Okay. So I guess another qualification would be if you're married, don't do this. Yes. If you're married, okay. stay far, far away. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you just like your life to implode. Okay. Well, some people like that. All right. Um, so let's talk about, so we, you, you know, let's go out and move on to like the date. Are there, is there any research on what makes for a good date? Cause I know guys, it's sort of, even in our, uh, progressive culture where men and women are seen as equals, it's sort of expected on the guy to sort of be the initiator. Um, so what should guys be doing or planning to really knock it out of the park when it, on the, that first date? Okay. So, so another great question. So, um, if we go back to, women's inherited desires, just like men have an inherited desire for youth and beauty, like men can't pass on their genes without youth and beauty in a partner, because that indicates fertility. Women have this inherited desire for willing and able provision. And so a man who really wants to impress a woman is going to play into that desire. He's going to do everything he can to show, hey, I'm not only able, but much more importantly, I'm willing. As I started to say earlier, you know, the bus driver probably has a wife. It's not really important how able you are to provide. It's very important that you're willing. And what this translates to is men, the first thing you need to do is be as generous as you can be. Do not hold back. That doesn't mean that you have to sweep her off her feet at expensive restaurants. It means that you pursue her. Because, guys, if you're waiting for her to take the initiative, how willing can you be if you're not even asking her out? She's looking for willing much more than she's looking for able. So you have to show willing by doing the pursuing. You should be the one calling. You should be the one texting. You should be the one writing letters. You should be the one sending cards, sending flowers, uh, opening the doors, and, pay and picking the restaurant and paying. And the reason for that is not because your great-grandfather told you so. It's because it's a, the, you're wanting to impress this woman. I mean – you know, now if you just want a booty call, just treat him any old way and see if it works. But if you want to impress this woman, then you need to tap into her inherited psychology, which says the man who loves me is the man who puts effort into this and risks himself and sticks his neck out and takes the, the chance that I could reject him. And so you're going to you're going to take the lead and you're going to be generous. And by generous, I mean, whatever you ask this woman to do, you're going to plan it and you're going to pay for it. That's generous. It's an open spirit. It doesn't mean you always pick the five-star restaurant. It doesn't mean that you ever pick the five-star restaurant, actually. Um, if you're a student, for example, and what you can afford is a picnic at a park, you ask her to go on a picnic at the park, and you plan the picnic, and you bring everything, and she will be wowed. Unless she really is a gold digger, she's going to love you for that. Yeah, like when I dated my wife when I was in college, uh, it was like I took her to football game she thought that was really fun and i chilies took her to chilies uh, of all places but uh she appreciated that i made you know initiated and and offered that and paid uh and it worked out we're married now been married for almost 10 years now well congratulations well, yeah you. and yeah brett that's exactly what i'm talking about right there you know for you that date probably actually wasn't all that easy for you to provide and she probably knew that and she respected and admired you for doing what you did. And, and good-hearted women view you that way. They view you as, wow, look, given what you have, look what you've done for me. You made this plan for me. I know that uh, I did a survey at my website where I asked men and women alike to describe anonymously 
to describe their best date and their worst date. And I wasn't asking for, you know, the date rape stories. I was asking for a normal date where things had gone well and where things had not gone well. And women, it was very clear there were two huge things that just meant, dude, we just don't like you anymore. And the top thing that women hated was a cheap man, a man who got them wherever they were going and expected her to pay half for all the bill. And that was true regardless of other studies show that's true regardless of the woman's income level. What women hear at a, at an implicit level, meaning they're not necessarily consciously aware of this, but this is they recoil emotionally because the message there is I either can't provide or much worse, I could do it. You're just not worth it to me. And uh, usually when mon- men don't provide, it's the latter. It's I could do it. You're just not worth it to me. And that's that's the opposite of the message that women need to hear in order to fall in love with you. So um, so that's, you know, part of the deal. And then the other thing that women really wrote about, uh, the top complaint was lack of generosity or presence of stinginess. The, but what women wrote about when they were really remembering the best date of their lives, I mean, you could practically hear these women swooning over, over pixels. They wrote about the guy who planned something that was really thoughtful. Women are really into thoughtful because thoughtful indicates willingness. A, a thoughtful man is paying attention to what a particular woman likes, and he's endeavoring to give her something very specific. So one woman, the guy told her, um, you know, I'm going um, to surprise you. I guess he had told her what she should be wearing, but he didn't tell her anything else about the date, just the hours and what she should be wearing. And if I'm remembering this correctly, they hadn't been out very many times. Most of the people wrote about, you know, a date that was early in a relationship that made or broke it. And uh, so, you know, she had on her biking clothes. Well, he took her on a bike ride through really beautiful country, and she valued that. He knew that she valued spending time in really beautiful country. And then he took her to some kind of a ride your bike up and order at the window kind of restaurant, which, you know, couldn't have cost very much, but it was her favorite kind of food. And she was wowed. It wasn't an expense thing. It was a thoughtfulness thing. And it showed his generosity and it showed his willingness to do for her. He was basically saying without using the words, I am into you. I am thinking about what you like. And that does it for us. Okay, so it's thoughtfulness. Thoughtfulness, thoughtfulness. is huge. Okay. Generosity and thoughtfulness. So uh, what can men, you talked a little bit about this in, about in your book, but what can men do, and women, um, do before marriage to ensure that they have a long and, and happy relationship? Um, well, it's been said that there are two necessities if you want to be happily married. You've got to... Pick the right partner, and then you have to be the right partner. Picking the right partner means that you're going to pick somebody kind, respectful, and highly similar to you. And this implies that you know what kindness and respect look like. I actually go into detail in my book about what kindness and respect are and what they aren't because there are some people who really don't know what that's like. Think about how most people are raised. A lot of people really haven't had very good role models for those qualities. So you learn to recognize those qualities, and you learn to only continue dating people who continue to exhibit those qualities. And you also commit to something that very few men, and actually not so many women, are willing to do. But it's really important to do this. Make a list of everything you want in a life mate. And this list is going to do three really important things for you. And it's interesting. I ran into somebody the other day who had read my book, and she said that she had heard the list idea before. She'd never done it because she thought she had the list in her head, and she really didn't need a list. It was so dorky to have a list. She said that after she read my book, and I made the case for this list, that she actually wrote it down, and she said, oh, my gosh, it was so different to write it than to think that I just knew it. The list does three really important things for you. Um, The first important thing is, it makes it more likely that you will notice Mr. or Mrs. Wright. So, guys, you're looking for Mrs. Wright. She might actually be right in front of you, and you haven't noticed her because you didn't really realize what what you're looking for. I I drive a Mini Cooper, and I've had the same car for 10 years. I love my car. I hope it never dies. 
and the thing is, I remember when I first got that car, I started noticing Mini Coopers everywhere. It was like the planet was just covered with them. Now, did buying the car make Mini Coopers appear, or did buying the car make me notice what was in front of me? Just noticing. Yeah, it was choice B. The list does that. It makes you notice who's in front of you. So that's one of the things the list does for you. And the other thing is it makes you do first things first. Right now we have a culture, um, our dating culture largely operates like this. People meet, they're attracted, they engage in some level of sexual involvement, uh, they start getting to know each other, and only as the relationship has gotten fairly serious do they figure out whether or not they're compatible. The list lets you do first things first. The, getting sexually involved first and then hoping it works out, that's backwards. That's based on thinking that love is enough, but it's not. And so doing first things first would be, I know what's on my list. I know what my deal breakers are. And if I see any deal breakers, I stop dating that person. I determine who gets into my life. And then that means that when I fall in love, it's with someone where it will work out. This is someone who's kind, respectful, and highly similar to me. It really just cuts a lot of the heartache right out of the equation. Okay. And then the third thing the list does is it helps you stick to your standards, not just identify them, but stick to them. Um, my best friend, whose complete story is in the book, and she did wind up very happily married, but she got, she broke up with this guy who um, the relationship ended because he was devoutly Catholic and she was a devout atheist. I use the word devout because really it takes faith to make either decision, in my opinion, anyway. So uh, they broke up over that. But here's the thing, Brett. They, they knew the day they met that she was an atheist and he was a Catholic. And, and they knew that that was a deal breaker. But they did what people right now are doing, which is they said, but she's so beautiful. But I'm really attracted to him. And they you know, got deeply emotionally involved. When they broke up four years later over something they knew the day they met, it was heartbreaking. Yeah. So, just, so that's really what need what people need to look for. They need to look for that kind, respectful partner who's similar to them, and who they additionally fall in love with. So the the list sort of helps you uh, use your head, like bring in your the rationality before. It's sort of like a, a like a what's a, a fire guard against the emotions, right? Getting the best of you. Yes. Yeah. So. Falling in love is a very emotional thing. And, you know, it's funny, Brett, it, it occurs to me as we're talking, probably most of your listeners, like most people in the world, think that women are more emotional than men. But it's interesting. Research across a large number of domains in relationships indicates that men are actually far more emotional than women are and that men are less logical in love than women are. They're just more purely emotionally driven. And so uh, actually, in some ways, I think that the list is much more important for men to have than for women to have, because men tend to fall in love in this very implicit kind of core gut level without really examining anything else. And I certainly have known some men who fell in love that way and just lived a train wreck of a marriage for years that made them miserable because they weren't a little bit more calculated about it. Interesting. Yeah, I've, I've read studies like that too, where uh, men are usually the first to say "I love you." Yes. In a relationship. Yeah. And they're much more likely to fall in love at first sight. I, yeah. It's funny. I didn't realize that falling in love at first sight was a real thing because it never happened to me. But then I had somebody ask me the question at my blog, so I did what I do. I looked up science. Yeah, it exists. And these guys, it's mostly guys who fall in love first. And when you think about, again, inherited mating psychology, evolutionary psych. In a, in a way, it makes sense. Women value willing provision. Well, do you know what the top sign is that a man's willing? What is the top sign? I don't know. If he's in love with you. Okay. There you go. So women have basically selected men to be less logical and more purely emotional about this and to fall in love really quickly and really hard. And, you know, sometimes that works. But what works a lot more of the time is know what your standards are. And do not go there until you're sure a person is meeting your core standards. Very fascinating. Well, Duana, where can people find out more about your book and your work? Okay, so uh, you can find out more about me and my work at lovefactually, that's with an F, lovefactually.co. 
And uh, my blog is called Love Science. But if you go to lovefactually.co, you'll see uh, where you can get a free chapter of the book, and you'll see uh, where you can buy the book. For those who just are like, I just want to see what people are saying about the book, uh, you can get a free sample of the book also at Amazon.com. The book's available in audio. It's available in ebook, and it's available in paperback at iTunes, at Audible, at Amazon. And you can see, you know, reader reviews and um, also professional reviews of the book. All right. Well, Dana, Dwayne Welch, thank you so much for your time. It's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you. I really enjoyed it, and I hope your, uh, your listeners do too, and it was delightful. Thank you so much. Our guest today was Dwayne Welch. She is the author of the book Love Factually, and you can find out more information about her book at lovefactually.co, and you can, it's also available for purchase on Amazon.com as well as iTunes and iBooks and bookstores everywhere. Well, that wraps up another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. For more manly tips and advice, make sure to check out the Art of Manliness website at artofmanliness.com. And I'd really appreciate it if you got something out of this podcast to go and give us a review on iTunes, on Stitcher, or whatever it is you use to listen to the podcast. Really appreciate it if you'd recommend it to a friend. So until next time, this is Brett McKay telling you to stay manly.